Thank you for listening to this download of Start the Week, presented by Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. In a shockingly short space of time last year, Islamic State used guns and bombs to take possession of large areas of territory in Iraq and Syria. It also used Twitter and Facebook and Tumblr to invade our collective imaginations, appalling most people, but also appealing to some, enough to persuade them to leave their homes and join the fight for a global caliphate. The journalist Patrick Coburn saw this coming a lot earlier than most and has written a book about the rise of Islamic State. He's joined today to talk about violent jihad and those it threatens by Catherine Brown, an expert in counter-radicalisation and counter-terrorism, Lena Hoffman, who studied another branch of extremist Islam, Boko Haram, and Gerard Russell, a former British diplomat who travelled extensively in the areas now threatened by Islamic State, talking to members of the religions it hopes to wipe out for his book, Heirs to Forgotten Kingdoms. We begin, though, with uh, Patrick Coburn, uh, you've written a book, uh, The Rise of Islamic State. Uh, you describe very early in this book this very significant transformation, just over 100 days that IS, as it were, transforms the, the situation in the Middle East. Why, why did it happen so fast? Was it e everything had been building for years and this was just the final move? or was? Yes, I mean, things had been getting worse um, within Iraq, the Sunni, who were the main Arabs, were the main supporters of ISIS, were getting more marginalised and alienated. But above all, it was the start of the war in Syria which destabilised the whole area. And from that moment, ISIS becomes more and more important. They, they, had a, they have a lethal combination of uh, military expertise and religious fanaticism. And when you put the two together, they're a pretty potent military force. Um, it's not an optimistic book. You say the overall expansion of their power will be difficult to reverse. Um, why is that? Why is it going to be so hard? I mean, they have. You're, you're pessimistic about Kobani in the book because it's written, as it were, before the end of that battle. They have been pushed out of Kobani now. Are you are you still as pessimistic? I, I, I wish I could say I wasn't, but I am rather, um, because uh, they still hold pretty well the area that they held last year in Iraq, northern Iraq, western Iraq, eastern Syria, which is about the size of Great Britain. They lost Kobani, but they've advanced in other areas of Syria. They sustained about 600 American airstrikes in a very confined area while fighting some very determined foes, the Syrian Kurds. Uh, that shows that they're pretty tough. They're not going to give up. In Iraq, uh, similarly, they hold almost. They've lost some towns, but not much. So I don't think the world has quite got onto the idea that these guys are not going away, that these are only marginal reverses. And equally important, that their opponents aren't getting that much stronger. The Iraqi government, the Iraqi army, above all, isn't coming together as a potent force uh, to take back the areas that ISIS took last year and the Syrian army is getting weaker. So, in many ways, they're just as strong as they were, if not stronger. Um, that was part of the shock of the events of last year. Um, uh, the Iraqi government had spent, uh, according to you, $41.6 billion on an army. Uh, it appeared to evaporate like mist. It didn't uh, evaporate, it was stolen. <laughs> it was stolen. <laughs> it, it, it didn't disappear into the air, it disappeared <laughs> into various pockets. But it's, it, So it's pure corruption just made it incapable. Yeah, I, I asked a, a four-star... Iraqi general retired just after the fall of Mosul in June last year. Why had this happened? Why this sort of catastrophic defeat? And he said, well, corruption, corruption, corruption. Um, if you're in the Iraqi army, uh, first of all, you have to pay. If you want to be a colonel, it costs you about $200,000 or it used to. Divisional commander used to be about $2 million. The reason is that uh, a lot of the Iraqi army doesn't exist. Ghost soldiers. Uh, the government admitted yeah. to 50,000 of them. It's probably much more. Um, and their salaries are pocketed by officers and officials. Then you you, you have, quote somebody as saying people p people pay to get into the army, but they're investors, not soldiers. It's, a, yeah, it's a, I, an investment <laughs> opportunity, basically. Yeah. Early last year, an Iraqi politician said this to me. I couldn't quite believe the Iraqi army was in this state, given the enormous sums that you just mentioned had been invested in the army. And he said, no, 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 it won't fight, because, as you say, they're, they're investors and they're not soldiers. If you go on the roads in Iraq, you see checkpoints... They'll probably let you through, no problem. But if you're a vehicle carrying goods, 
it, it's like a customs post. You have to pay money. Um, lots of people are in the army. They get paid their salaries. They never go near a barracks, but they kick back half of that to the officers. So this it, it, it's basically a sort of kleptocratic machine. Uh, now, the other problem is that the Maliki government did not kind of sustain an, an equable balance of power, and so that the Sunni majority has, has also felt estranged, as you said earlier. And that, that presents another problem too, doesn't it? I mean, the, the yeah, retaking right. of Mosul is infinitely more difficult because of that. Could you just explain? Yeah, I mean, is? this is, goes to the heart of it, that up to 2003, this, basically the Sunni uh, were the leading power, leading community in Iraq. Since then, it's been the Shia and the Kurds. Above all, this is a Shia government. And the Sunni community felt alienated, marginalised, uh, you know, very rough stuff. I mean, in some villages around Fallujah, there are no young men because they've all been jailed. Often they've confessed to crimes because they've all been tortured. Sometimes they confess to crimes which they're going to be executed, which is somebody else has been executed. But at the same time, ISIS plays on this because they have endless or have had endless uh, suicide bombers, uh, bombs going off in Shia markets outside mosques, butchering hundreds, thousands of ordinary Shia, then they retaliate against the Sunni, and then the Sunni have no uh, alternative but to look to ISIS as their shock troops to defend them. Um, do you think there's anything to hope for from the, the internecine um, battles amongst jihadis? I mean, uh, ISIS set up Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria and then a little later decapitates it. So there have been cases, a lot of cases of these groups fighting each other, as it were, for you know top dog status in jihad. Is there any optimism about well, that? Or? There could be, and but it sort of it hasn't happened yet. And at any level, whether you're another jihadi or you're ordinary people, rising up against ISIS is not something to get wrong. I mean, one tribe in eastern Syria they killed seven hundred people. Some similar thing in Iraq. Uh, this is a you know ISIS. It's very much a killing machine. So it's difficult to do that. They always monopolize power uh, wherever they can, and that's why you had this uh, split in Syria. But you've ended up with the Syrian armed opposition basically all coming together under these two different al-Qaeda-type organizations. Um, Catherine Brown, you wanted to come in. Yeah, Patrick, you said they're a killing machine, but one of the ideas that's put forward why ISIS is so popular to young people in the UK and in Europe is that they're offering themselves to be more than just a killing machine, that they're trying to create a state rather than just be this warrior fighting force. So how does that play into this idea that all they do is kill people? Well, I mean, the two things are not contradictory to my mind. Militarily, that's what they do. Uh, they're very good at manipulating and uh, projecting terror, but they also have this utopian aspect of what they want to do, of this is going to be the new caliphate, this is going to be the new perfect state. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's very appealing yeah. to people outside and some inside. Yeah. Um, do you buy that? I mean, of course, it's incredibly difficult to report this now because you, if you go there, you get killed. Um, but... But do you, is there evidence that they are establishing a, sta a working state, bureaucracy that operates that... Yeah, they've always been amazingly bureaucratic with sort of monthly reports of how many car bombs, how many assassinations. <laughs> I mean, it looks like, you know, report from a commercial company until you notice that actually it's all about uh, violence. That's, so, not, that's not going to hold uh, mm. popular support, though, is it? Popular support no. is going to hold if your water runs and your electricity mm. runs and it's safe to go out in the streets. Are they any better than the Iraqi government at that? Yes. Um, in some ways, they, it's got more dangerous because there's bombings. I mean, they're dangerous people themselves. But, you know, in, they control pr prices in Mosul. So things are cheaper than they are 50 miles away in Erbil, the, the Kurdish capital. Um, Lena Hoffman, you, uh, did you want to come well, in? There? I think uh, what was interesting from what uh, Patrick was talking about in terms of parallels with uh, the case in Nigeria with the Boko Haram insurgency, um, talking about corruption in the um, federal forces amongst the armed forces in Nigeria and how that is challenging. Uh, um, it's a challenging situation for the Nigerian government to... to curb this insurgency, especially in terms of an election coming up in about two weeks. So I thought 
that's quite interesting to in terms of uh, the parallels of corruption and low morale in the armed forces and it being quite a significant uh, issue in terms of um, dealing with the insurgency now. No, I'm reading both of your sort of books and papers. It, mm-hmm. it, one is forced to the notion that an incompetent government is one of the worst threats to peace in this region because it oh, just really? allows everything to seethe up. Yes, and, uh, you know, nothing is... Nothing works, you know. Iraq, hundred billion dollars a year in oil revenues, down a bit this year for because of the fall in the price of oil coming in. Yet, you the, the lights keep going off in Baghdad. Very similar. Uh, in, in lack Nigeria. of fresh water. Yeah. Uh, you can't, you know, sewage in the streets. All these things. And despite significant um, uh, military spending, um, you said Iraq uh, have spent mm. about forty-six billion US dollars. Mm. Nigeria spent about thirty-five billion US dollars in um, for um, acquiring mm. military hardware and the offensive in the northeast. But that hasn't really brought the kinds of results people would like to, to so see. Soldiers ran out of bullets. I mean, I mean soldiers are running out of bullets. Uh, what you said, Patrick, about the uh, record keeping is quite evocative of the old Ba'ath government in Iraq, which, of course, was fantastically good at keeping records of everything. Mm. Do you think there is a core of former Saddam people involved in the administration of ISIS? I think there are some, yes, and from the old Iraqi special forces, the elite parts of the Iraqi army, uh, some Ba'athists. But I think probably more important reasons is military experience. If you've been in fighting... Since 2003, you've been fighting the Americans, you've been fighting the Iraqi army, and you're still alive. You're pretty good at what you do. So I think that the sort of survival of the fittest. So combine that with certain administrative capacity coming from the old regime and military experience, and you have a very powerful force. Um, Catherine Brown, I want to turn to you because you've studied very closely, not the professionals, as it mm. were, who've, but the amateurs. Yes. Uh, you, you, you have researched sort of attempts to recruit people to uh, Islamic State and also the, the ways in which you can prevent that happening. Um, female recruits make a very good media story. They here. do, yeah. They get a lot of attention. How large is the problem in truth? In truth, you're looking probably around 10% of recruits from, if you take in total Western Europe, uh, women represent about 10%. And that's actually in keeping with other non-state violent organisations that have quite hierarchical and small C conservative agendas where, yeah, women make up about 10%. So it's in keeping with trends that we can see from the 1980s spreading forward. Um, so r- roughly what are the numbers? I mean, you say 10%. But, uh, OK, so you're probably looking at the moment, I think, from the UK... 20 or 30 women that we can be relatively sure of, possibly more. But so, the, it, so they have a larger weight in our minds yes, than they actually yeah. and do. And across in... Europe, it's, it's a bit more than that. Um, the problem also that you've got is how you can verify who's gone out there and how. Because if we rely so much on social media, people will often have multiple accounts in the same in different names, but it's one person. And also what they're reporting back, it might appear very authentic, but it's also very good messaging in, and there's um, a, a story they're trying to sell as well. It's not just this is my life and it's warts and all. Actually, they're selling a story back to their families, back to their friends and back to potential recruits. Um, Boris Johnson the other day um, dismissed, um, because of uh, British recruits to Islamic State, with a a word I won't use at this time in the morning, but essentially said, you know, the porn-obsessed losers. Um, Leaving aside whether that's true about the men, it's clearly not the case with the women, I would have thought. Um, So what what is drawing those who go? I would... I would say it's too easy to turn around and dismiss young people saying that, oh, they're porn obsessed, it's all about sexuality, or it's... I think it's much more compelling to look at the push and the pull factors. And the push factors are very much this sense of alienation. These are, in the women's case, very well-educated, intelligent young women. They're not um, without thought in what they've decided to do. And also they're relatively... Uh, well off in the sense you can afford to travel out to Turkey and then afford the cost and travel and so on Um, so there's an an alienation there's a narrative here in the UK that says you're not welcome, you're part of the problem and then what's interesting what Islamic State does exceptionally well is present a version of life 
that has meaning and that says you are welcome, you're not part of the problem, you're in fact what we need, especially if you're a young doctor or a trainee doctor or an engineer, you're part of what we need. And also we need men and women to start families because it's the family side that then provides the state and the citizens that give them that legitimacy beyond the fighting force. But this doesn't make these young women jihadi brides. This isn't a romanticism about they're going to find some hero. It is much more about a romantic notion of a good life, as a good life that you and I might find abhorrent because of the nature of what Islamic State are saying. But nevertheless, it has an appeal and it has meaning. And I, yeah... You can, it's interesting, Aksa Mahmood, who is one of the, the um, British uh, women who yeah. went out there, wrote a, a diary, um, and it was rather intriguing from her. Y- you could interpret some things from what she was telling people not to expect. Yeah. One of the things she told them was not to expect to fight. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing was she told them they should expect to marry yes. and don't come if you don't. So that implied that there were, she was getting a lot of messages from from young women who did want, as it were, independently to go out and take part in military action. Yes, yeah. And I think there's a sense of adventurism with that. And I think that notion of doing something exciting was part of that. But I'd also say that for the young women that have gone out there, not all of them have got married. There's this notion of you can live in a a sister's house and you will actually be provided with a stipend uh, by the state and that you can carry out ordinary tasks but that life that there's a real disjuncture between ordinary life where you, there are tweets and social media about getting nutella and crepes and doing the housework and some of the struggles with that because it's not easy living conditions and then reporting about the violence on the street and that yeah. that real tension between those two ideals is really present is there any? I mean, um, Islamic State have been um, fantastically adept at using social networking to get a violent message out. Is there any research on how how much women also do they disseminate beheading videos? Do they, you know, post as it were the more atrocious pictures as, yes. at the same rate as men? Um, it'd be hard to say whether it's at the same rate, and part of that is about access. Um, there were. There was a, um, a blog written by a Malaysian female doctor who said, you know, I've got my stethoscope and my Kalashnikov, you know, hand in hand, what more could I want? But even she said that over time it became harder and harder for her to travel around Iraq. And so then the ability of women to to witness these things is harder. But their willingness to repost and their appetite to glorify the violence and to, uh, in their language, honour those who have died is just as prevalent and do, almost encourages as and well. And do they address at all, I mean, the, some of the things which have shocked um, sort of um, Western observers, the sale of Yazidi women, for mm-hmm. example, do they address that at all? There were one or, or two that, that suggested it. They initially said they were surprised to see slaves in the houses, um, but they didn't really then go on and question what that meant about how women were treated on as a whole and why their sense of emancipation seemed to come at the cost of other women and there's a real tension there between some women gaining quite a lot of power from doing this at the expense of other women so we can look at this idea of a moral police force in some of the towns set up by women but what that does is impose their notion of what it is to be a good muslim woman on other muslim women and when you then look at those police forces being um, predominantly made up of foreign women introducing this idea, no, 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 you have to wear your niqab in this way, it has to be of this heavy weight, Uh, on local women. I I was curious about what proportion of recent converts there are um, in in the group, in those who travel out, um, whether they are more zealous in their application of... Um, No, I don't think it's necessarily the zeal of the convert per se, but again, I think they have more... Uh, credence in the media back here and they also then have greater appeal because they appear more challenging to the West, uh, to Western governments in that sense. Um, you said you don't think insulting um, insulting the, the you know likely recruits is going to work. No. What might? I think introducing, uh, this sounds uh, typical from an academic, right? But what I'm going to say is introducing critical thought and critical education in schooling, especially in religious schooling, and I'm not saying necessarily in the mosques, but I'm actually saying in our schools, to enable people to think about how, if you believe Islamic State partly about a religious narrative, then you need to enable young people to think about religion in a way for themselves, rather than relying on rote learning or just this very narrow understanding. I think you picked up, Patrick, about education and the limitations of that in some places as well. Um, And 
introducing a much more thoughtful process and changing the the narrative that we hear that just because you're young and Muslim and possibly an orthodox Muslim makes you a problem. Actually, they have so much to give and I think it's a real tragedy that they find more meaning in ISIS than here in the UK. Uh, it's a long-term project. Uh, Patrick, you wanted to come no, in just, on that. I was just wondering, what proportion of, sort of suicide bombers are women? Because it's very noticeable in Iraq, women can move around more easily than men because most of the century posts, the checkpoints yeah. are men and they won't search women. Yeah. Um, Iraq's quite interesting because it actually distorted long-term trends about women's participation in, in suicide terrorism. Um, and worldwide, you're looking at about 26% of attempted suicide bombing are carried out by women. And in Iraq, and uh, it is somewhat less. Um, I don't have the exact figures offhand. What's really interesting is you don't find anywhere near that number in Afghanistan. Um, and you would think that there would be because the Shia tradition have more of a... A history of allowing women to participate in jihad than the Sunni traditions do. So that's really interesting. But you're right, there is a willingness to use women because it's tactically advantageous, because you can't stop and search them. Uh, Lena Hoffman, this is also true, I think, in um, northern Nigeria, isn't it, that yeah. women are used, in, in the girls are used. I, I think particularly since the um, the abductions last year of 200 girls from Chibok, um, we've seen um, Boko Haram use this as a tactic um, sending out female bombers and they're increasingly uh, a disturbing tre trend is that they're younger and younger. The last um, bombing we heard of in um, in the northeast was a 10-year-old girl. So I think it, it, the way we, for Boko Haram, the way they justify using female bombers and using particularly younger and younger female bombers is... Um, that uh, the Nigerian military forces have captured their women and imprisoned their children. So it's a, re it's, it's a retaliation on the Nigerian state that if you take our women and our children, we'll take your women and we'll take your children too and we'll use them against you. So tactically, I, I think in, in talking about parallels between Boko Haram and ISIS, I think um, it, it will be dubious to and an and overstretch to think about this global arc of terrorism and, and yeah. there is some kind of strategic operational coordination between Boko Haram and ISIS. Though it but has in been terms reported of recently. inspiration, yeah, I think I, in many it, ways... There was a report recently that ISIS had sent, or IS had sent, advisers to Boko Haram to improve their, I as it were, PR. I think in terms of mutual and, admiration on both parts, and I think quite last week Boko Haram apparently opened a Twitter they did. account and they are, you know loading, uh, putting up um, videos of, of training uh, events. So they are inspired by, by ISIS to, uh, to a degree. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a cocktail of um, military tactics, suicide bombing, other uh, things that they use, various ideological similarities. Now, this is often misinterpreted, I think. People look, is there a conspiracy? Yes. Can we a get a telephone call, somebody yes. calling a village in uh, Waziristan mm. in uh, northwest Pakistan to get instructions from Mr and Big there, as yes. we've all seen in the yeah. movies? But it doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't. It's a, I think it's a combination of effective ideological mm -hmm. and tactical uh, and, and important to, to, to really focus on the fact that Boko Haram, like ISIS, comes out of its regional context. These groups are locally rooted. Their interests are just, in the politics of the region. Just explain to us briefly. I mean, you say uh, in your paper it's, it's much more complicated than largely Muslim North, predominantly Christian South. Um, can you briefly give us the more complicated version? No, absolutely. Version? Well, uh, um, I think... Much of the diversity of Nigeria is lost in this narrative of a largely Muslim north and a predominantly Christian south. The, the north of Nigeria is made up of a diverse group. It's, it's, it's religiously mixed, ethnically mixed, and the northeast of Nigeria has quite a number of smaller uh, um, ethnic groups that are predominantly Christian. Um, the insurgency has happened, or, or the Boko Haram insurgency has come out of this very mixed background of multi multi-ethnic and a very diverse community. And as much as we talk about um, triggers and drivers uh, of the conflict, there's so much more going on outside of just um, a radical ideology, but so much going on in terms of political context for it, local grievances um, between the Kanuri, that's the predominant ethnic group in the northeast, and the House of Fulani. So there's so much more on the ground, and this is very, very local. I was very interested to read that um, 
one of the um, factors in the, in the surge of Boko Haram was the enactment of Sharia laws in the north, that that was seen as though it was going to be a solution and disappointment with the fact that it wasn't has okay. given Boko Haram an opening. It's, it's as though they're doubling down. They say, it's, well, we tried Islamic law. It didn't work. We've got to be even more. It's a driver. Uh, I think at the time that uh, Boko Haram emerged in the early 2000s, um, Nigeria was going through a period of quite significant political instability, uncertainty. It was coming out of 16 years of military rule. And particularly for northern Nigeria, it was in a great state of flux, high rates of poverty, unemployment. And Boko Haram began not as a violent movement. It was a fringe movement. Uh, it, it ran a welfare system, supported lots of poor Muslim families. The leader, the first leader of the group, Muhammad Yusuf, he was an ideologue. He was particularly charismatic in his preaching and he was quite, he was known very publicly and celebrated across, you know, Meduguri and Borno. So the, the roots of the group are, are, are largely in this um, backdrop of you know, political uncertainty and comes out of that. Um, is there a, an essential... Gerard Russell, I wanted to bring you in. Is Do you think, having studied religions all over the region, I mean, not in uh, Nigeria, is there a drive, once you start down that road to greater piety, is that a slope, a slippery slope, that you? it's very difficult to come back up if, you're, if your position is that we are more pious than the last group? There's always well, well, an element of competition, I suppose, between these groups and... Uh, I think there is uh, an element to which when you have, let's say, Shia Hezbollah uh, succeeding in, in Lebanon against the Israeli army, then <clears throat> you know Sunni Hamas feels the need to imitate them. And Al-Qaeda and Islamic State compete to the same degree. Uh, I suppose uh, what you also have is a spread across the world of a much more you know, uh, inflexible form of, of religion, particularly uh, in the Islamic world at the moment. Um, I think that, Lena Hoffman, you, uh, I, I didn't know that, as it were, there had been a caliphate in northern Nigeria, Absolutely. but it was a Sufi caliphate. It was a much more tolerant, much more tolerant easygoing brand yes, of yeah. Islam. And that has now effectively been driven out in Exactly. I mean, historically it had, but there's no exactly. prospect of it At returning. the time of um, when Nigeria was colonised, I think the takeover of the um, Sokoto Caliphate, which was a 100 years old, it was um, very vast, going all the way to Cameroon up to Senegal, and um, they, it ran autonomous emir emirates across northern Nigeria. So there has been uh, an Islamic uh, political tradition in northern Nigeria for centuries. This was moved aside or streamlined. Sharia law was streamlined in northern Nigeria after you know the colonisation of, of the country. So there have been demands for a return to Sharia is that part over of, decades But is, that, is it part of Boko Haram's rhetoric? that they want to recreate this pre-existing caliphate. I think there was a more tolerant um, approach to, the, to this at the start of, of, of the movement. Um, as much as, you know, there was an utopian idea of a Sharia state, it, um, the initial leader of the group, Muhammad Yusuf, did compromise his position in terms of not being engaged in secular systems of government, you know, abhorring elections, etc. In 2003, when the move, members of the movement and himself supported uh, uh, um, a state governor, the state governor of Borno State, for his election. But there was an understanding between the movement and the group that was you know, they fell out later on that there would be the implementation of core Sharia values and, and Sharia law in the state, but the uh, the state governor, but, you know, backed out on yeah. that. So uh, The narrative is similar to, to Iraq absolutely. and Syria, isn't it? It's not uh, what gives rise to this group is not, as it were, a deep and passionate desire to stone women for adultery. It's, it's yeah. a deep and passionate desire for some kind of authority you can trust. Yes, um, yeah. They, but, but I think that also what, what's Patrick happening Coburn. is that there isn't an alternative. In the past, there used to be a nationalist alternative to appalling, corrupt, uh, cruel governments, or later a socialist alternative. None of these are really ideological alternatives anymore. So if you're in eastern Syria, an Im unemployed young man with no future, no job, family very poor, everybody's betrayed you, then ISIS seems pretty attractive in comparison. Um, yeah, and I just Catherine I Bell. thought what was really interesting is the ability of Boko Haram to um, almost 
redefine what Sharia means as well. So that so to itself, take yeah. it, yeah, to redefine it so that it, it can then be reincorporated into their political messaging in a way that perhaps you didn't see before. And I think you see the same with ISIS, is that what Sharia means is very localised and open to, to interpretation, interpretation in a way yeah. that isn't before. So that it's not, it can't just simply be said, oh, this is a religious problem. This is about how religion intersects with politics. Politics, absolutely. And I was really interested. Why do you think that Boko Haram haven't drawn so many uh, foreign, as in white European fighters, to its cause in a way that, say, Islamic State has, given there are so many similarities? I think for the particular thing about Boko Haram, or maybe the interesting um, feature about it and similarities with ISIS, is that it has really evolved over the last decade or so. I think the change in leadership when Muhammad Yusuf was killed off and then we saw uh, Abu Bakr um, um, Shekau, um emerge, he is a more radical, less charismatic more bloodthirsty version of, of, of Muhammad Yusuf. So I think in terms of it's I think they, they have evolved in strategy, in methodology, in membership as they've gone along. I, I, I would like to presume that maybe the early membership of Boko Haram wouldn't recognise the Boko Haram we're seeing today because this wasn't the intention of the movement. I think there was more of a, 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 an, an appeal or an attempt to change the system from within, particularly with the Muhammad Yusuf leadership. But that was truncated at some point in time. Do so they, it's really do they gain in terms from of, this assumption that they are linked together in a, a network. I mean, uh, they're on the point yeah. of... Yeah. Th they're they're clearly puffs, thinking it, about... It puffs off their local profile if they're able to attach themselves to, you know, global narratives of uh, um, Muslim emancipation from Western domination. So they all, ISIS benefit from this yeah. arc of global terror. It gives them legitimacy on the ground and globally, yeah. What would be the purpose of these massacres in... Uh, January that we all saw with estimates of up to 2,000 people killed. Is it just general bloodthirstiness or is there a specific motive that they went for these towns? I think in terms of the um, the massacre in Baga town, uh, the Boko Haram have contested, um, you know, the town of Baga with the uh, Nigerian military forces several times. They've been hit quite a number of times in the last year or two. Uh, I think there's a strategic um, importance to Baga. It's a fishing town. It's on the borders with Chad. So there's a, a, an interest in, in, you know, holding, you know, capturing and holding Baga. But the ma massacres themselves, uh, I think the motivation is the shock the Can I just war ask quickly, because I want, to turn, it, I want yeah. to turn to Gerald Russell. Who's, uh, w are they killing co-religionists in Baga or...? They're killing anyone who does not believe what they believe. So they're killing so it doesn't matter Muslims, if you're Muslim, Christians. Christian. Yeah. It does not matter. If you are not one of us, you're against us and you are, yeah, you know. Uh, Gerard Russell, this is a, a somewhat melancholy theme of your book, an underlying implicit theme of your book, um, Heirs to Forgotten Kingdoms. If, if you are not with us, you're against us. Um, you're writing about essentially endangered species of human belief. I mean, those on, on the fringes of survival, um, Yazidis, uh, Mandaeans, Manichaeans, Zoroastrians. Um, it matters intensely to you, I think, to preserve this culture. Why should it matter to us as well? I suppose when I began to research these religions, I just found such a variety of, of fascinating things. And I know that's not a reason to want to preserve something in itself, but... The fact that they had survived, in the case of the Mandaeans, for 1,800 years, that they'd kept the language and some of the traditions of ancient Babylon, that there were things among what the Yazidis practice, including their bull sacrifice, including their tradition of praying towards the sun, that go back many, many thousands of years to the very first example of human literature, actually, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which describes that same bull sacrifice which they practice to this day. Um, what I also thought was important, two things, really. One, that the things that they believe, and we can be uh, mystified and stupefied by the extraordinary things that they, that they teach and believe, that's our Astrian affection for dogs and contempt for cats, uh, or uh, um, the Yazidi belief in, in the lord of the universe taking the form of a peacock. Um, but there are also several embedded in that, several very, very interesting philosophical ideas. So the Yazidi belief that the devil has repented and been forgiven is a very long-standing uh, debate, really, about 
whether there can be anything in the world so evil that it cannot be redeemed. And for many early Christians, and indeed Muslims, encountering Zoroastrianism, which taught that there was no one single omnipotent God that ruled the universe, it was very important for them to, to say there is, and therefore the devil cannot be so evil that God cannot choose to uh, forgive him and bring him back to heaven. And so that Yazidi belief in the peacock angel, which seems so bizarre, has at its heart uh, a very old and very interesting uh, proposition. But the second reason why I think they're important, important to us, uh, among whom they are coming to live, and important to the Middle East, which they're leaving behind, is that for many, many decades in the 20th century, which was a relatively tolerant period religiously in the Middle East, um, they have contributed enormously to the diversity of culture. And actually that goes back more than a thousand years. There was a, a mathematician called Thabit ibn Qurra who was brought to Baghdad in the 9th century who was a, uh, a pagan scholar. I mean, at least he was certainly from a very non-Islamic culture, uh, which has since ceased to exist. Uh, but he was uh, treasured enough to be brought to Baghdad and wrote there a great ode of praise to paganism. Um, and that was a, an element of the tradition of tolerance in Islam, which I don't wish to exaggerate. It's no religion in, in human history was ever immensely tolerant, but, uh, you know, which was definitely there, an ability to coexist. Well, you do make the point that back in the Middle Ages, I mean, the reason these religions survive is that Islam was more tolerant towards a different kind of belief than, in, than Christianity was. You know, a lot of our pagan religions were ruthlessly extirpated. Theirs lived on in these little pockets. Yes, the, the Quran always had an acceptance in it that certain religions were tolerable. And um, many of these other faiths, whether they truly were in that category or not, uh, managed to persuade Muslims that they were, uh, partly because they were essentially monotheistic uh, and partly because they didn't have a tradition of, of idol worshipping, which is the thing that always got the attention of, of Muslims and Christians in a very hostile way. Um, now, religious belief is is the object of fascination in this book. I mean, you are fascinated by it. You clearly regard it as precious. How do you distinguish... It's, but it's also clearly a huge problem in the Middle East. How do you distinguish between a faith which legitimises murder, uh, you know, and, and one which doesn't, perhaps only, because it doesn't yet have the numbers to do it? I think that what's what baffled me a bit about about the Middle East, perhaps, is that... It puzzled me how we, people there had lost, perhaps, the ability to, to be pious without having any degree of hostility to the, towards those who don't share one's piety. And that was once there, uh, and an older generation of people had it, were very pious Muslims, for example, um, but without having any hostility towards um, those who weren't. Even within the religion, there may be a problem. You talk, you, you talk and visit all uh, the people who are still... Um, still worshipping in these faiths, and then also the children who are not quite as strict. And you talk at one point to a young Mandaean uh, called Nadia, who explains that she refused, as she grew up, to sit at a different table when she was menstruating. Now, that seems to me a real test case. I mean, presumably you applaud that act of resistance, or don't you? Because that is an erosion of the faith too. I think... It's not a violent one, but it would eventually mean that that faith might well disappear. I suppose I tried to avoid making judgments about others' beliefs, but I, I think these faiths will have to adapt to the modern world, particularly as their followers come to live in, in, in countries where many of these traditions don't make sense. If you live in a very strict Muslim environment, although you may not be Muslim, some of these traditions are much more acceptable because they are followed by those around you as well. Um, for example, marriage rules. And that's the toughest test, because if you are a Mandaean or a Yazidi, I mean, the Yazidis have astonishingly complex rules about whom you can marry. I met a Yazidi man living uh, who, who said to me, in my home village, he said, of 10,000 people, there isn't a single woman I'm allowed to marry because I come of the, a certain caste and tribe. And now he lives in Nebraska, <laughs> uh, where there are about 100 other Yazidis, and, you know, his chances are t absolutely gone. Well, so that they thank will goodness for the internet, or <laughs> yeah. perhaps thank God for the internet. Uh, Catherine Brown. I was just really curious. You talk about uh, these faiths as being tolerated, and I think there's a difference between tolerance and acceptance, yeah. perhaps, that might be also uh, a way forward if we, we shift a bit away, away from this. We have to tolerate other faiths in the way we have to tolerate minority faiths here in the UK, as opposed to accepting them, which I think is a more positive way. And I was wondering how that comes about and whether there's a move towards acceptance as well. 
but also I was curious because your book really challenges this idea of a clash of civilizations, this idea that there has to be some inevitable violence and also that we can put the world in binary terms, the world of peace and the world of war, uh, as Islamic State would put it, or as the West versus the rest. As you, you And I, I really like the ways in which your book challenges that and I wondered if you could tell us a bit more about how does this come about. Yes, I thought one of the things that, that really came out for me from going to Lebanon, talking to the Druze and discovering there the immense connection they have with Greek philosophy. And, and much of their religion can be understood best by going back to, to the Greek books before Islam, actually. And they're not, they're not entirely embarrassed by that. Uh, but that they, like many of these groups, cannot easily be defined as being Islam or not Islam. They've sat on the cusp of many different religions and they, for many centuries, were left untroubled by that. And it's more, in more modern times, sometimes people are being pushed to define yourselves as, you know, this or that. Um, Patrick Coburn, it, it does feed into, I mean, I, uh, Islamic State talks about the filth of the Safavids. You know, the doctrinal difference is a real engine for violence, isn't it? Yes, it is. And um, you know, everything has seen through a sectarian perspective. And you come across in Iraq... Sunni who say, oh, I don't have a sectarian bone in my body, Shia likewise, then you mention a specific uh, Shia politician. Oh, you know, he's an Iranian agent. Uh, what about that uh, town there or city? Oh, they're all really Iranians there. But uh, I did want to come back to the idea of clash of civilizations, which seems to me one of the silliest ideas that's ever um, b become prevalent. I mean, this violence is within Islam. I mean, the people who are killing each other in Iraq and Syria... It's not against Christian civilization, 99.9%. .9%. But I did want to ask one question, uh, just to be a bit more concrete. It has, to, the, it has to be asked quickly and yeah, answered very quickly, quickly, just because but, of the time. Uh, the growth of intolerance, how far does this come from Saudi Arabia? The fact that the Wahhabi variant of Islam, very intolerant, has become predominant within mainstream Sunni Islam. You've I think, got, I think where, to answer it quickly. Where I'm money comes from is terribly important. But there's also something else, which is globalisation and a growing awareness among uh, different cultures of the differences between them, which are sometimes heightened by the way those differences are reported. OK, I've got to stop you there, unfortunately. Thank you to all of my guests, Dr Catherine Brown from King's College London and Lena Hoffman from the Luxembourg Institute of Socioeconomic Research. Uh, just about to head off to Nigeria this week. Stay safe. Uh, Patrick Coburn's The Rise of Islamic State is out and Gerard Russell's Heirs to Forgotten Kingdoms uh, is also available. Next week, Anne McElvoy will be here looking at life in the suburbs. For now, thank you and goodbye. There's more information about Start the Week on the programme's website. Go to bbc.co.uk where you'll also find many more Radio 4 programmes you can download for free.